I read 18 books in January and February, which honestly is a little bit scary. But anyway, in this video, we're gonna wrap them up. I never actually aimed to read this many books. I just got into a bit of a, uh, I don't wanna call it a rut because that sounds ungrateful for <laughs> the levels of productivity. But sometimes I use reading as an excuse to not do anything else. And then Jan and Feb's were those months. Like reading was a real crutch for me. I was moving jobs and there was a stressful period and then there was a period of calm and in both those periods, I was reading at an alarming rate. Okay, enough of that. Let's get started. I'm just gonna do these in chronological order as well. First off, we have The Vanishing Half, which it's by Britt Bennett, who wrote The Mothers, which I really enjoyed. And The Vanishing Half also was a very spoken about book. I remember it being recommended so much when it first came out. And for that reason, my expectations were really high and it didn't quite meet them, unfortunately. But I enjoyed myself. It follows the lives of two sisters set in the 1950s to the 1990s. It's kind of multi-generational because you also learn about their kids' lives as well. And it's about race and identity and family. And in both cases, the sisters kind of leave their very small town where they were born and they end up going down two very separate paths and kind of reinventing themselves, but in very different ways. So it's a very interesting tale and it had a lot of charm. I really liked some of the characters, but overall I just, it didn't stick until the halfway point. I don't know, maybe there were pacing issues or something, but I basically only started to really enjoy my reading from the halfway point roughly onwards. And for that reason, I can't rate it crazy highly. Next up, we have The Vegetarian, which is a really, really original book. Maybe original is the wrong word. It's very unconventional, um, by my standards at least. I don't think I've read anything like it, um, but it was a library audiobook. And you know that I can't say no to a library audiobook. It's not very long, but it manages to pack a lot of punch. It's based on another short story called The Fruit of My Woman, and it's set in modern day Seoul and it follows a woman who is a kind of part-time artist and housewife and her husband in my opinion is a pretty terrible person and she basically starts to have these nightmares about meat eating that are very gruesome very gory and feature a lot of cruelty and pain and they're these really really vivid awful nightmares that make her or compel her to stop eating meat so one day she just stops eating meat she throws out all the meat in the house she declares that she's no longer going to eat meat the story kind of goes from there and it follows how her family the people that know her respond to her not eating meat and people don't respond well so if that's a spoiler i'm sorry i did sort of like this book, but not loads. It's really, really gory and upsetting and kind of disgusting. And there were times when my like pure revulsion wasn't being outweighed enough by enjoyment. I actually almost put it down at one point, uh, but I did soldier on and I am like sort of glad that I finished it, but I don't know if I would recommend it to people unless they were asking for something very specific. Good material. This is a Dolly Alderton number, and if you've watched any more of my videos, you'll know that I have quite mixed feelings about Dolly Alderton's writing, and this book's no exception. It follows a guy who is broken up with by his girlfriend called Jen, and he's our main character, and he's a very mediocre comedian. He feels overall very lost, and like a bit of a failure and a really big part of the story is the fact that he does not understand why Jen broke up with him. The book was really touted as this super empathetic story. You know, he's flawed but he's charming and I honestly really didn't like his character but I also felt like the writing was quite patronising. The structure was also really odd because actually I'm not going to spoil it but the structure was just a bit weird. For me it lacked build-up. It's not for me but it does have that really familiar 
Dolly Alderton like comfort charm voice so if you really loved other books of hers then you probably will really enjoy this. Next up we have Babel which I really enjoyed. I'm getting more into fantasy and sci-fi. I hadn't read any of that really uh, until June when I read June last year. So this is a really fun one for me. I had pretty high hopes and it pretty much hit those hopes. It's set in 1830s England and it's all about colonialism and in this like fantasy, historical fiction with fantasy elements world, the British Empire is underpinned by powerful silver bars that are magical and the magic is based on translation and the bar's power comes from stuff that's lost in translation, so it comes from words that in other languages are similar but don't have like identical translations and it's about like the gaps between those words and the gaps in meaning between those two words in other languages. I'm sorry if that wasn't explained well, it's one of those concepts, you read about it it would make sense, like it's not a very complicated concept in the book but to explain in a few sentences is clearly challenging for me. Um, our main character is a boy who actually is born in China and then brought over to Oxford to study there at the Translation Society to help maintain and, you know, use these bars. It's all about him experiencing just the formative years of being in Oxford, but then also struggling with the more he discovers about the work he does, the more he's like, am I? the bad guy? <laughs> What's that from? Is that from Peep Show? Oh, that's a really good, that's a really good reference if you know what scene I've just played to myself in my head. Um, R.F. Kuang, who wrote this book, describes it as a love letter and breakup letter to Oxford and that is exactly how it feels. Like when I read it, the way the, the Oxford is described, um, like just the images that are planted in your mind, like the atmosphere, it really is brought across so effectively and I actually enjoyed the book a lot for that reason. And the characters are pretty good, the mystery element, like there's a lot of intrigue, a lot of the time you don't know who's good and bad, who's good or bad, and what's really going on in a good way. Taking a swift turn, we have the literary fiction that is French Braid by Anne Tyler. I listened to this as an audiobook and found it, I just don't think I was the right audience for it, or at least it's just, it's just not for me. It is very sharp and like, you could tell that it had great observational powers. Our main-ish character, although it's about loads of different characters and a bit of a sprawling family, but our sort of main character is called Mercy and she has been with her husband for ages and she has loads of kids and she basically decides to move out and like sort of break up with him but without saying she's breaking up with him. Um, she gradually moves into her art studio to pursue art as her career and it's about her kids having left home and just like the reality of her life and her trying to find herself again a little bit. Uh, I think this is a book that I probably would have enjoyed if I were, if I could relate to Mercy a bit more, like if I were a bit older, I had a few more years under my belt, I had a few decades of marriage or relationship under my belt. Poor things. So I did a whole video on this. I read this book because I was going to watch the film and uh, recently I've been really enjoying reading the book before watching the film. It's heavily inspired by Frankenstein and it's about a Frankenstein monster woman uh, who is created and when she's born or sort of brought back to life, she has the brain of a child but the body of a woman. It's about her finding her way in the world, uh, she kind of goes away, does loads of travelling um, and it's it's very odd but it's very charming and I think has some really interesting perspectives on power imbalance and womanhood and growing up. I think at times it was a little bit, like my attention drifted a little bit 
but I'd still recommend it overall. It's very clever and felt quite unique and especially if you enjoyed the film or if you're planning on watching the film, uh, it was a really fun accompaniment. Sorrow and Bliss, this is another slightly TikTok known one, I think. Am I like weirdly low down on the screen? It's because I'm tired. It's because I ran 18 kilometers today. If you must know. This is a novel about a middle-aged woman who has struggled with mental illness for her whole life and struggled with it quite severely for her whole life and it looks at how she's dealt with it or not dealt with it. It's not kind of overly sugar-coated but it also does deal with her in a really empathetic way. Uh, I really enjoyed it a lot. It's a little bit humorous as well. It kind of had quite a lot of Fleabag energy if you've read or if you enjoy Fleabag. Like a protagonist who is kind of unlikable in a way comes across as quite self-involved, like very destructive, very difficult, but you end up kind of loving her still somehow and you end up rooting for her. Um, and I like books that do that. And this book did that. Seven Days in June. This is all part of my trying to find my romance jig. Is that the right word? Trying to find my romance rhythm jive trying to find romance books that fit for me because I know they're out there. I didn't absolutely, absolutely love this book um, but it was enjoyable enough. It's about Eva Mercy who is a single mother who lives with chronic illness which that was a really cool element actually I thought. I feel like those types of things just get completely erased. You so rarely see people with chronic illness in books. Either the whole book is focused on this illness or it's not mentioned at all, but I think the balance of having someone where it's not the focus of the book, but it's just something that she has to deal with in her everyday life, it's realistic and I appreciated it. She's an erotica writer and this mysterious other writer, Shane Hall, returns to New York in the middle of a panel that she's in and everyone's gasping because he's a bit of a celeb and he barely ever comes to stuff and he's an excellent writer and it turns out that she had a romance with him when they were teenagers and it was brief but it was intense and he comes back and they have another romance. My Year of Rest and Relaxation. I was very excited to read this book because it's everywhere and it also felt like something that I might enjoy. Um, it was a bit different to how I expected it to be. I did really like it overall. You have an unnamed protagonist who has decided, she's, she's very depressed basically, but she's also quite a bad person and she decides to sleep away her worries. She finds herself a very weird, definitely shouldn't have any kind of access to pills doctor who is happy to just prescribe her and prescribe her and prescribe her sleeping pills and she just takes a cocktail of sleeping pills for a year until it's at the point where she's barely awake, she blacks out constantly and she's not really engaging with her life um, I think what I enjoyed about this was that she didn't have any responsibilities, she's inherited a lot of money from her parents and so all the regular things that you'd think a book like this would focus on, like the way that, you know, poor mental health and substance abuse can destroy your life, it just doesn't destroy her life because she has no responsibilities. So it, it was kind of it's just a bit weird and confusing, but in a way I enjoyed. Daisy Jones and the Six, I loved. I just think Taylor Jenkins read. She's never let me down. Her books are so, so readable and so juicy. They're often around celebs. So Jay Daisy Jones and the Six is about a rock band, like they're the rise and fall of a band in the 1970s. But the way it's told is, it's the same as in the show, if you've seen this show, the, the book is written as a kind of documentary style. So it's all sub subjective. It's just quotes from interviews with each band member talking about what things were like. So that's a, that brings a really nice energy to the book um, and the structure suits the story really well because the mystery of how they broke up is like, is a big thing in it. Stay True. This one is pretty stunning. This is a memoir written about a friendship that was cut short because his college friend who he kind of met in his first 
year was killed in a carjacking and it kind of feels like like it was written for that friend it's very artsy because the focus is really on the atmosphere at the time and actually this was a part of why i personally didn't like the book didn't give me exactly what i wanted because i wanted a book that focused on the friend a bit more the relationship the grief i was really looking for that like the human feelings element but the book a lot of it is about like what things were like at the time and what going to college was like for him and it was a lot a lot of the writing was like focused on his interests and also his experience as an asian american um and how it contrasts his friends who i think he was is second generation like the author second generation immigrants and then the friend that he had met who was really cool and was really kind of well assimilated with american lifestyle his family was Japanese and had been in the US for like three or four generations and it was very interesting learning about the contrast between their experiences. A love song for Ricky Wilde. So the same author as Seven Days in June, which I wasn't actually going to pick this up, but then it was recommended and described as genre bending and I was like, you know what? I'm going to have a little look. So this is kind of a romance, but with fantasy elements there's a kind of ghost time hop witches curses element to it and i did enjoy myself it was a bit too cheesy for me in places but that is a classic thing that i struggle with with romance overall i really liked the characters and it was just warm it was just a warm hug of a book that i had a good time reading romancing mr bridgerton this is the book that season three of bridgerton is based on and I read this because I thought season three was coming out sooner and I was a bit worried. I thought this book would be not good, but I had a great time reading it. The Bridgeton books are so enjoyable and I kind of surprised myself with how much I enjoyed reading Regency romance. I think it's because contemporary romance, I'm constantly asking myself, you know, how realistic is this? And often contemporary romance just makes me cringe because I'm like, who would actually say that in real life? Or I just don't think scenarios are realistic. And I know they're meant to be an escape and they're meant to be unrealistic, but my brain, I just can't handle some of the stuff in contemporary romance, but Regency romance where it's never, I'm never gonna expect it to be realistic. I just allow myself to sink in to this complete like fantasy other world. Um, I think I also find it quite funny because they're all, so like formal and emotionally repressed and it's kind of i enjoy the conundrums that come out of that book lovers another one from my romance stint this is the first contemporary romance book that i have truly loved again this was actually a recommendation because emily henry i've seen her on tiktok but after reading colleen hoover like my trust in TikTok romance has just been really low. Emily Henry on the other hand, it still is very cheesy, like book lovers is an enemies to lovers trope, but I don't know. It isn't all about the romance, there are other challenges that the characters are facing and they just feel a bit more complex and the characters little quips and little jokes you know with their friends didn't grate on me in the way that they often do my dark vanessa so i actually read the author's note right at the end and it was quite interesting because the book is about a 15 year old girl who has a relationship with her 45 year old english teacher and the book came out very or a few years or relatively soon after the me too movement started and like gained loads of traction and so that's incorporated into the story but reading the author's notes apparently this book was like 15 or 20 years in the making and it was actually quite a delicate business when me too happened and she kind of felt a bit conflicted because she was like i don't know if i want to write a book that feels like it's just capitalizing off this movement but she was kind of saying like it was actually a long time coming and reading the book 
I really believe her. Obviously the premise is not nice, but I was still surprised at how moved I was and how incredibly disturbed I felt. I really, really liked the book, but it had me thinking about it quite a lot for a very long time. I think the one element that was brilliant, but also like quite upsetting was how she portrayed Vanessa, who's our 15 year old. You you see, a, you have a little window into her life as a 30 year old and she believes that the relationship was consensual and that's the focus of like that stream of the story. Okay, Memorial. Should I move this, tilt this a bit actually? Just so I, instead of setting up, I'll just tilt. Okay, Memorial by Brian Washington. This I was really not what I expected. It's kind of romance, but it's about two young guys called Mike and Benson who are maybe coming to the end of their relationship and Mike just leaves. They live in America, but Mike's dad is quite ill, so he leaves America as his mum comes and visits and his mum and Benson end up just hanging out together and it's about relationships and love and the trials and tribulations of relationships and maybe like love coming to an end. It's a really thoughtful story but Benson and Mike's relationship is so dysfunctional. I can see why for some people it just hits and they just love it. But for me, although I really did love, as I said, Benson and then Mike's mum, who they've never met each other, they don't really have language in common, but they end up having this quite sweet, borderline hostile, but somehow cute also relationship. So that was kind of funny. The Blind Assassin. Um, I'm on this massive Margaret Atwood train right now because loads of her books are at the library and um, The Handmaid's Tale is one of my favourite books ever, so... I'm not complaining. But it's been really interesting reading her other books because The Handmaid's Tale still completely stands apart for me. A lot of her books are kind of dystopia, fantasy. She has a really distinct like writing style, but I don't know. None of them are matched up to The Handmaid's Tale, but they've been pretty good. She's a- Margaret was a good writer. Hot take, I know. So The Blind Assassin, I m amused myself thinking about how to describe this in this video because if you have a Google, it's described as a risky affair in the turbulent 30s between a wealthy young woman and a man on the run. But that's like really not what it's about. As per usual, so many different things are going on and there's so much clever metaphor and a billion meanings. You have these mostly two different timelines. One is these people having an affair and they meet up and a huge part of their chatter and a huge part of that stream is them describing this sci-fi alternate reality story and he's really going in depth describing the laws of the universe and this completely separate story and then the other stream is a little bit multi-generational but it's mostly about two sisters. See? I can't do it justice. I don't know how to describe this story, um, but you really have to be there. <laughs> you have to read it to understand what I'm saying. I also think that me describing it is not very, it's not gonna compel you to read it because I just don't have the magic that Margaret Atwood has. For whatever reason, I found it so emotive and I loved reading it. Finally, I read Climate Change is Racist, which it kind of does what it says on the tin. It's about structural racism and how climate change, although it's caused by majority white people in majority white countries, the people that it, who suffer the worst effects are people of color in poorer countries. Um, that's like the opening argument, opening statement, and it goes on to give loads of examples and statistics and explain it in a really accessible way. Uh, my one gripe is just that it's definitely an introduction. I'm trying to read more non-fiction because I've just read so much fiction and I need to sometimes return to the real world. I think I'm all done here though. I think it's over. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've had a lovely weekend. I hope you have a lovely week. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one. Goodbye!